Hi, friends. This is not a sequence to what I was talking about today, and I, I've, I've come back after uh, sitting down and talking to the camera for several minutes about something that's been on my mind and has bothered me, and um, I just wanted to come back and say, if you're not interested in me ranting about the healthcare system and the police in the United States, <coughs> Just turn this off now, because that's what this one is about. But uh, before you turn it off, uh, I have some other videos coming up. One of them is about assisted living here on the north shore of Lake Chapala, because uh, moving here and retiring is uh, great, but uh, you get older and older and older, and at some point, uh, you're going to need something besides just a place to live. You're going to need some help. So assisted living here and some of those facilities, I, uh, I'm working on a video about that. I also get a lot of questions about uh, how good is the internet there. And I'll do some research and come up with some real numbers on uh, download speeds and costs and different services available. And people keep asking me about a tour of my house here, so uh, I'm working on that too. Anyway. Uh, come back for those if you leave because you don't want to hear me rant today. Thanks for watching. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. I want to start today's video with an apology. Uh, and I want to apologize about what I'm going to talk about today. That may sound a little strange, but I'm going to talk about uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And for those of you who have um, watched my video about why Mexico and the story about Blue Cross Blue Shield not paying a pre-approved claim, uh, being the straw that broke the camel's back in our decision to make Mexico our permanent residence, uh, you'll understand why I like to talk about Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, the reason it the reason I'm apologizing is because I don't like to put together videos so close together about some of the things that irritate me, like the health system in the United States, uh, which I think is relevant no matter uh, where you're living in the United States. Um, insurance companies in the United States, big pharma, and these are things that I like to rant about occasionally. But I just did one of those last week. and. I'm apologizing for making another one so soon. Uh, if you are one of those hundreds of thousands of people who watch that video I just referred to, and I'll put a card up here so if you haven't seen that you can go watch it. Um, you know why it's personally um, relevant to me to talk about this, but um, I think it's relevant for a lot of people who are watching my channel because you're 40 and 50 and 60 years old and uh, health care in the United States is something that's uh, uh, relevant to you. We retired when we were 55 and I always like to say I never got a chance to retire, they fired me. Uh, what happened was I lost some contracts that I had had for 27 years, business contracts, and uh, we decided that we, we were forced into making a decision. I either had to look for a job or retire, retire. And we had the uh, savings and the uh, financial assets to be able to retire in the United States, um, except for one thing, and that was the cost of health care. At the time, uh, my health insurance premiums, and I'm talking about 2001, my health insurance premiums were about $10,000 a year with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon, uh, private policy, the best one you could get. And um, our other medical expenses um, deducted uh, as a deduction on my 1040 tax returns was running six to $8,000 a year. So that was part of the budget that we had to sit down and say, well, we're 55 years old, can we afford to retire? That's $18,000 a year, and uh, that was a big part of the budget. 
And again, we could afford it. But here's what we didn't think we could afford. Now realize we're 55 years old. It's 10 years until we're going to get uh, uh, old enough for Medicare in the United States. And uh, that's a big game changer for a retiree's budget. So we're sitting there going, okay, that's $18,000 a year. Um, what are we going to do about this? And our decision was to move to Mexico where we could afford at the time to be self-insured. And then we found out you could get you know, great, um, a, a great deal on uh, medical insurance in Mexico. But uh, I think it's relevant for you today of what I'm talking about because if you're at that stage in your life where you think you can afford to retire with the exception of the medical uh, uh, cost or the insurance cost of your premiums in the United States, and there's another part of it. There's uh, the premiums and then there's the excess pay, uh, payments because it always works that way. Your insurance company pays this, but uh, the radiologist, uh, that wasn't part of the deal, or the hospital has some extra charges, and um, that's why my excess charges, and my wife has a lot of medical problems, uh, were running six to $8,000 a year above my premiums. Um, and, well, part of that is because of my deductible. But anyway, still $18,000 a year, and that was part of it, but it's not all of it. The rest of it is the fear of something catastrophic happening, happening and totally wiping us out. Anyway, that's why I think it's relevant for me to talk about um, things related to the healthcare system in the United States. Uh, it's relevant to... Moving to Mexico, if you're in your 50s or 60s, before you have Medicare. Now, we came down here and, uh, in an old 1989 Southland motorhome, back and forth three years, and then we parked it in the yard. Now, I say we were 55, so after three years of doing that, six months at a time down here, and still having Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, we... Uh, bought a property here, we canceled our insurance in the United States, our health insurance, and we didn't leave Mexico uh, very much at all for seven years until we turned 65. We didn't go to the United States because it felt like Russian roulette going to the United States without any health care there. So for seven years, that old Southwind sat here in our yard. And when I turned 65 and got Medicare, and then a supplement, uh, we started, we moved the, the motorhome to Rapid City, South Dakota, and then went up there a couple of months a year and enjoyed the Black Hills of South Dakota, and toured around, and went to Oregon to see our kids. And, and, um, and then uh, three years ago, we bought that bigger, nicer Monaco motorhome. But it's Medicare and a supplement that enables us to do that, and it's 10 years of not being old enough for Medicare that encouraged us to move to Mexico to make retirement affordable for those interim years between, yeah, we can afford to retire, and Medicare. You know... I started with an apology because I'd much rather be talking about my RV life <laughs> and my wonderful retirement life in Mexico um, and sharing my beautiful home. But you know, in life, um, everything is not always wonderful. And it doesn't matter where you live or who you are, there's going to be some crap. And um, medical issues are certainly one of the things that fall into that category, and something that is relevant to all of us, no matter your age, no matter your country. Um, it's something that we all face as part of life on this planet. 
Well, anyway, what got me thinking and talking about that today was I had a subscriber who wrote me a story about Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I'm going to read it to you. And um, all of that was an explanation about why I would be reading something about a horror story of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Because Blue Cross Blue Shield has been a horror story in my life, and I want to share another one. Funny you spoke of Blue Cross Blue Shield, headquartered here in Alabama. My doctor recently took them on and uh, said that they were actually screwing with the patients, denying items, meds, and services. Well, that struck a chord with me because 20 years ago, Lynn and I were fighting that. Don't leave me a comment that says, oh, you should have gone to the state insurance commissioner. We did that twice, once, a, once and prevailed. And once it was for $11,000 for a, a pre-approved pain clinic program in Portland, Oregon, uh, Emanuel Hospital. And we took it to the insurance commissioner and Blue Cross Blue Shield finally paid in full. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been trying to tell the doctors how to manage their patients. My doctor told Blue Cross Blue Shield that he wanted nothing more to do with them and that patients could just file for reimbursement with a receipt. Yeah, good luck. This is a good, honest, legitimate doctor. This began between him and Blue Cross Blue Shield about two years ago. Well, it's awfully funny that the FBI and the DEA came in while he was open, but the government was shut down. Um, that doesn't mean anything. Essential services do not shut down during a federal government shutdown. And I'm laughing because uh, uh, in January, the most recent government shutdown, I was sitting in uh, La Posa South in uh, Quartzsite, Arizona, watching the police issue tickets for people who are driving faster than the 15 mile an hour speed limit, <laughs> making dust. Government shutdown, but the police don't shut down during a government shutdown, neither would the FBI and the DEA. Anyway, while he was open, the government was shut down and they kicked open the doors, came in with their long guns drawn and laser dots pointed at everyone. Patients, nurses, office staff, and the doctor. Some of these patients were wheelchair and bed bound. They even searched everyone's cars in the parking lot. No one was arrested and no charges have been filed of any kind. They did take everyone's medical records, leaving the doctor with none to help his patients. Blue Cross Blue Shield pretty much runs the state of Alabama. I just wonder why they came kicking in the doors when they could have just opened the doors and walked in. Why were there 50 to 60 agents for such a small office? And why, why rifles had to be deployed? I am nearly 50 years old and it scared me just thinking of those that were older than me in their 70s and 80s. Something is going on here, my friend. Well, I don't know if that's a true story. Uh, as I said, it's just something one of my subscribers wrote. Uh, I don't have any reason to think that it's made up, um, but it is scary. It scares me. <clears throat> and if it doesn't scare you, and I'm not talking about being scared because the FBI and the DEA came in with their guns. That's just how they do things. Um, it scares me to think that... Uh, Insurance companies in the United States are denying doctors the ability to manage their patients' care. Uh, there's another thing going on that, with that with the opioid crisis and how doctors and pharmacists are facing uh, criminal charges for filling prescriptions. Anyway, um, like I said, I don't know if that story is true, but that part about the guns coming in blazing, 
I'll give you a, a, another story, and this is not about um, health insurance, but it's about the police and their guns blazing in the United States. <clears throat> uh, and I know this one is true because it happened to me. I owned a rental property in Portland, Oregon. Nice little house, two bedrooms, small dining room, uh, nice yard. And I had a nice young couple that had lived in there for about a year. Um, two young children, the youngest uh, girl still in a high chair. And one February, the neighbor called me and he said, do you know that your house is open to the weather and there is water running out of your yard down the street? Well, I went down there right away and I found out that uh, all the neighbors said there had been a police raid of a suspected heroin dealer three weeks previous to this. And my first question was, well, why in the world wouldn't the police let me know that there had been a raid uh, on my property and uh, had left it with nobody in it um, three weeks ago? I mean, I I'm the registered owner as uh, in public records. I get the property tax statements. So uh, I'm not hard to find. Well, they didn't. And by the way, uh, I had, after this, called and talked to every police agency I could possibly think of. The county police, the city police, the state police, the FBI, the DEA, everyone I could think of, and nobody, no jurisdiction, would take responsibility or admit that they had been there. Well, I found out, um, I did find out that the husband wasn't home when the raid occurred. Now, this wasn't a standoff. It was a young mother with two children, one of them in a high chair, sitting and having an evening meal at the dining room table when this happened. A battering ram busts the front door out of its hinges. A tear gas canister busts through the plate glass window on the living room into the living room carpet and burns a three foot circle in the carpet. The police rush in. I'm sure they had guns drawn. But again, this is not a standoff. The husband wasn't home. And I don't have any problem with the police doing a raid uh, on a suspected heroin dealer's house, but it wasn't a standoff. Why didn't they just like knock on the door and say, hey, is he home? No, well, come with us, let's talk about this. Nope, they're having dinner and uh, the front door is battering rammed in. The tear gas canister comes through the plate glass window into the living room. I'm sure there is some fright. Police rush in with their guns, no doubt. Um, and again, I'm not criticizing the police for that. I'm criticizing them for not letting me know. So here's the rest of what I found when I got down there. Uh, it was one of those Januaries, the previous three, three weeks ago, in Oregon when it had frozen. And that's unusual in Portland, but it happens. And the pipes had frozen, and then when it thawed, uh, they were burst and water was running. And there's a crawl space underneath the house that had a swimming pool's worth of water in it. And there was a small space down there where the um, hot water heater and some other uh, things were down below the floor of the house. All of that was ruined. Um, the kitchen was probably the worst. The refrigerator was emptied into a pile in the middle of the living room floor. Things like... Um, pickle bottles, a ketchup bottle broken like it was thrown to the floor. Uh, they had unwrapped all of the frozen meat in the freezer 
and thrown that into the pile in the middle of the floor. Now this is three weeks later. It is rotten and rotting. Um, also in the pile are all of the other things in the kitchen, like the silverware drawer. The, the forks and the knives are in the pile. The drawers are emptied into the pile, like, you know, the, the, the towels, the things you keep in drawers in the kitchen. The canisters, the rice, the flour, the sugar, dumped in the pile. And again, you know, they're looking for heroin, and I understand that, but... Wow. The bedroom, the mattresses are cut, slit with a knife or a razor blade. Um, the rod in the closet is jerked down, busted out of the wall. There are clothes strewn all over the room. And these weren't messy people. Uh, I lived with I, I had them as tenants for a year. I, I'd been in the house. They, didn't, they were very good housekeepers. Uh, the walls in the bedroom and the dining room were busted in with the battering ram. Again, looking for heroin, I'm sure. The, uh, in the backyard, I have a cement block little storage building um, with a metal door that was... They, apparently they had to hit it many times with the battering ram to bust it and its frame out of the cement block uh, enclosure. Um, and inside, all of the cement blocks are busted in with the battering ram. There's like line after line after line all the way around the room uh, where they had broken in the cement blocks. Again, looking for heroin. Um, and again, I'm not complaining about the police trying to arrest a heroin dealer. It does disturb me that a young family is sitting at their dining room table and instead of knocking on the door, they come in with guns and tear gas canister blazing, battering, battering ramming themselves into the place with their, undoubtedly, their guns drawn. So, anyway, I call as I said, every police department, and nobody wants to take responsibility for the damage to my property. So, of course, I call my insurance, Allstate Insurance. Guess what? Police uh, actions do not fall under vandalism coverage. They wouldn't pay. That's enough for now. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.